Hey, single roses, welcome or welcome back to I Buy My Own Roses podcast. It is me, Ariel. I am so glad you are here and I hope you are doing well. In today's episode, we are joined by a former classmate of mine. Her name is Carlissa. She's going to bravely share her journey with fibroids. Fibroids are non-cancerous growths that develop in or around the uterus, affecting millions of women worldwide. These benign tumors can vary in size and number, often causing symptoms such as heavy menstrual bleeding, pelvic pain, and even fertility issues. In fact, it's estimated that between 70 and 80% of women will experience fibroids by age 50. Today, Carlissa is going to open up and share her challenges, triumphs, and the lessons learned throughout her fibroid journey. Nothing that we say here on this episode is intended to be medical advice. It's just sharing the fibroid experience and bringing awareness to fibroids because it's something that we're not always talking about. Even for those of us who do not want to have children, it is still very important that we are taking care of our reproductive health throughout our lifetime and that we are aware of the options and treatments available to us so that we can advocate for ourselves and our needs when we go see our physicians. So in this episode, we will explore the impact of fibroids on women's health and discuss the latest treatments and strategies for managing this common condition. Again, this is not intended to be medical advice. So not only do you need to do your own research, but you need to make sure you are consulting your physician about what options might be available to you. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into it. Thank you for joining me today. Do you want to tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Um, I'm Carlissa Childers. Me, my sister, and my father own a home care agency. So I'm the CFO here. And um, I'm married, just got married in 2022. I have two Yorkies. We're going to talk a little bit about your story or your journey with fibroids. But first, can you tell the audience what are fibroids? Fibroids are non-cancerous tumors. They're smooth muscle fibrous tissue that grows in and around the uterus. 80% of women suffer from fibroids and they're normally categorized based on where they're located, whether they're located inside, outside, in like the uterine cavity or inside the muscles of the uterine wall. They can also be stalk-like and like hang off the uterus. Um, But the causes, they don't like know the cause of it. But basically, if you have a uterus, (laughs) you're like predisposed to having fibroids. And that's why 80% of women suffer from them. There are some things like when you think about weight and specifically estrogen, like they do say estrogen is one of the things that like fibroids feed off of. So of course, women that are bigger in size and things like that, certain diets and things can be like recommended to either ward off fibroids or shrink them, things like that. But there's no true cause because If you're a woman, you're probably predisposed to getting them. (laughs) What were some symptoms that you had? How did you discover that you had them? That's part of why I think it's so important that people talk about fibroids. Fibroids is such a broad diagnosis. It depends where they're growing, how they'll affect you and the symptoms. So realistically, I didn't think I had any symptoms. Um, I went to the OBGYN to get my IUD removed prior to getting married. And they weren't able to remove my IUD. So they sent me for an ultrasound and a transvaginal exam. And that's when my OBGYN referred me to an oncology OBGYN and told me I had these large tumors in my uterus. Um, well, technically, my all of my fibroids were outside my uterus. Yeah, so that was why I think it's so important because I think just diagnosis and finding out whether or not you have fibroids, it can be like hit or miss. When I got diagnosed, it was a very rapid, I guess, rapid progression of things because they found at least one fibroid that was like 12 centimeters, which is, they said like the size of a baby's head. So they knew that there was one that size and they also just knew that my uterus was enlarged based on the imaging that was done. So they sent me for further testing. I got an MRI done and I did go see the oncology GYN. And of course, luckily 
they didn't think anything was going to be like cancerous or anything like that. But that's when I started to go through the process of meeting with the doctor, finding out what fibroids is, what treatment looks like. That's why all those things can look so different depending on what type of fibroids you have and what your plans are for getting pregnant. Anything you decide to do treatment-wise is going to be based on those things. So for me, I went to get my IUD removed because I was going to get married. And honestly, I just didn't want to be on birth control anymore. It wasn't like, oh, I just want to get pregnant. But I just didn't want to be on birth control anymore. I was like praying for the day I could remove it. And I found out I had fibroids. So they obviously thought I wanted to get pregnant. So I had been dealing with a bit of chronic pain since 2020, lower back and upper back pain, and also just other issues that I, you know, you just think it's aging because I was turning 30 <laughs> and things like that. And so I didn't think I had symptoms. So when I found out I had fibroids and I started to do research, I was finding out all these things and actually putting my symptoms to some of the things that was going on in my body. So when it came to symptoms, I realized I thought I was experiencing acid reflux, GERD, um, constipation, bowel issues, your frequent urination. I thought I was experiencing all those things because I was just, like I said, going through aging and having GI issues. But then I realized that, you know, I was having a lot of pain in my abdomen. I was having um, hip pain, sciatica, like pain in my hips, um, numbness and tingling down my legs. And just during the two weeks around my cycle, I did not have crazy cramping, but I would have horrible back pain, lower back pain. I did start to realize that those were probably the symptoms of my fibroids. And I, the interesting thing is when I say I didn't have horrible cramps, I also didn't have horrible bleeding or like anemia, which is normally one of the symptoms that many women with fibroids have. And based on my research, I just attribute it to the location of my fibroids. I didn't have any what they call submucosal fibroids. Those are the ones that are on the inside of the endometrium. Those are the ones that normally affect fertility way more because obviously it's actually in the uterine cavity where you have to get pregnant. I think that's probably what also causes the extremely horrible cramps as well as the crazy bleeding that leads to anemia. Um, because I had all the symptoms that normally wouldn't lead to someone finding out they have fibroids, I feel like. And that's probably why I did find out in the way that I did. Once they discovered that you had fibroids and you got your imaging done, they gave you a treatment plan based on the fact that they thought you might want to get pregnant. If you want to share, like, what did your treatment plan look like based on your situation? So based on my situation, um, I found out I had fibroids in January of 2022. Um, I just had my fibroids removed August 31st, 2023. So I did live with my fibroids for over a little bit over a year after finding out I had them. The size of them, my doctor, he wanted to remove them immediately. But when he found out I was getting married and I wanted to have children, he decided that he would just go forward and remove the IUD and do a hysteroscopy, which is when they actually just take the camera during surgery and look in there to make sure that I didn't have any fibroids on the inside of my uterus and that the only ones visualized were the ones on the outside. I found out in January that I have fibroids. I met with the doctor in February. They scheduled me for my IUD removal in um, March 14th of 2022. I found out three days before my surgery that they weren't going to remove my fibroids. Originally, the plan was to remove my fibroids. It was like, okay, we're going to remove your fibroids because they're so big. Mm -hmm. um, and because he said that he didn't want to compromise my fertility, basically, once they cut into the uterus wall, they consider your uterus compromised for like abruption during pregnancy. So it's not the first line of action when it comes to fertility because they don't consider you infertile for like six months to a year of trying. So he wanted me to go forward and do six, mo six months to a year of trying to have a baby before I went forward with removal because his recommendation was that I did an open myomectomy, which is adjacent to like a C-section because you get physically cut open. It's not like the laparoscopic procedure where you have like a micro cut 
you actually get cut open a long cut around the abdomen and they actually go into the uterine wall and remove the fibroids. So that's what I had in August was an open myomectomy. Just so I'm clear, that decision only happened after the six months of trying for pregnancy? Like I said, I wasn't necessarily planning on getting pregnant the moment I got married. I found out in January I was getting married in February. When we go into the doctor side of it, that was one of those things where I did feel this pressure to try immediately. If we just talk about the emotional piece of it, of course, my mind was reeling and questioning my own fertility in that moment. Me and my husband, we did not try a lot because I was in a lot of pain. I did realize probably six months after not getting my fibers removed that I wish I had gotten them removed and that I probably didn't want to be pregnant in this much pain. If I had this much back pain without a baby inside of me, and then I'm like at the chiropractor watching pregnant women come in there, I'm like, this is crazy. <laughs> um, so I was like, I don't think I want to get pregnant. So when it came to trying, I probably lied to my doctor a little bit. I was like, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, when it came to about, I would say about May last year, I was kind of at the end of my rope trying to manage the symptoms. And one of the jokes that my doctor made when he actually discharged me was, yeah, I was surprised you weren't full of SHIT. <laughs> and like I say, it's bedside humor. But he said that because my fibroid, it was, it was sitting, he said it was sitting on my rectum. The largest one was sitting on my rectum and like lodged in my pelvis. And like he said, he's, he was surprised I could use the restroom. For the two years I had been, or for like that whole time, I had been on fiber supplements as well as stool softeners, just the regular ones that like Coley's, what they give pregnant women, not crazy stool softener, but I had to take that regularly just to use the restroom regularly. And then also like frequency of urination was, you know, I could, I, if I had to go to the bathroom, I had to go right then. So, you know, it was just like quality of life is what it comes down to when it came to me making my decisions about going forward with removal. I know some women do choose it based on fertility, but I, I do have to acknowledge that fertility was not a major factor in me specifically deciding to get my fibroids removed. It was just time. So I want to go back to the emotional aspect of what you were saying and the <laughs> pressure when the doctor was telling you, maybe you should try for six to 12 months. I know I have looked into a breast reduction a few times. And like, even with just a breast reduction, they constantly want to ask that question. Do you think you'll want to have kids? And like, maybe you should wait. And like, as a woman who really doesn't want to have kids, it's very frustrating. And there's even only a certain list of doctors. They put together a list of doctors in the country that'll even do it for you before a certain age without you having at least one kid. Or sometimes they want you to talk to your partner. If you have right. a partner, it's, it's a lot. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to ask you a little bit more about the emotional piece of things. When you found out about this, how were you feeling? I think it was very interesting because, of course, when I first found out, I was truly questioning my fertility and like literally crying over it, of course. First, it was, oh, no, I have cancer. But then it was like, you know, realistically, I know that these are probably benign tumors. And it's really just a matter of whether or not I'll be able to get pregnant or not. So it's very emotional because... On top of finding out you have tumors, which the interesting part is they really downplay the fact that you have tumors in your body. It's like, oh, you have tumors, you can live with them is really, I will say that's, that's one thing for sure. If you're diagnosed with fibroids, there isn't this, oh, we got to remove it. It's, oh, can she live with them or can she not? And like I say, it's really based on what you plan on doing with your life. And fertility wise, if you do have to get your fibroids removed and there are either any complications or for some reason, your fibroids are in some place where your, your uterus cannot be saved. So it's not just, oh, am I fertile? It's also, is treatment going to cause me to have to get a hysterectomy? So I was like, oh no, are they going to be able to save my uterus? I don't know. Because the other thing was, I did have at least one, like I say, very large fibroid. And I could tell like even by the doctor's reactions and like my ultrasound text reactions that I had a large fibroid. It wasn't what they normally see. They recommend removal if you have a fibroid over, 
I think it's three centimeters. And like I said, I had a 12 centimeter one. And when they did testing, they actually found out that it was two six centimeter ones conjoined. So I was thinking that they were just going to have to remove, remove my uterus completely. And I've also been someone who has gone back and forth on whether or not I actually want kids. Even though I'm married, I've been very open with my husband about that, that like it's really based on what's going on in the world, <laughs> whether I decide I want to have kids or not. So it also made me like really try to make a decision and it start putting that pressure on me that I didn't necessarily just have because I always wanted to be responsible about my decision. And now I felt like I was going to be making an irresponsible decision. I really do think it, I think it's a selfish decision to have kids in certain situations, you know, or just in general, it might be a selfish decision because you want to have kids just because, you know, so I'm like, if I just want to have kids, because I don't know if I'm going to be able to have them, like, that's not. Yeah. <laughs> um, I understand. So yeah, it was all of the, all of that. And then when you just think about how depression can be a symptom of the fibroid, it, and it can be a symptom for multiple reasons. It could be a symptom because of hormones, but it can also be a symptom because I was literally dealing with chronic pain. Um, sometimes I thought I was having a heart attack because of the acid reflux. Um, and the GERD, I always had like bubbles in the back of my throat and this was every day, every night, and it was affecting my work. So it really did. It was starting to take a toll on me. And that's why I say, I really can't say that for me, it was a fertility decision because by the time I got to, like I said, a year later, I was like, why didn't I get those fibers removed in March, 2022? You know, why did I go get put under anesthesia just so they could, see if I could get pregnant uh, like <laughs> you know it did feel like a waste but like of course in hindsight I learned lessons the growth all of that even just the challenge to myself because dealing with health issues entering your 30s dealing with health issues right off the bat is this 30 you know like right. my body breaking down is that 30 I wanted to like get on the other side of that I'm like what does the other side of this look like especially mentally yeah for sure I think it's really interesting that you said acid reflux. Like some of those things that you're mentioning, I've had, I'm sure other women who are listening, you've had those symptoms. Mm -hmm. I almost always associate stuff with weight. Like I'm slightly overweight. And so I'll just be like, oh, I'm having this because I'm not eating right. And then, you know, now all of a sudden I'm having these like acid reflux issues or fiber issues. These are things that are that are just like suddenly starting to happen. So I just think it's really important that we all just advocate for ourselves because the doctors are gonna, it's like they take the easy way out. No, they, they do. I think just in navigating this situation, I realized in a way the U.S. health system, it's only treating illness. So if like they don't, they're not going to consider fibroids an illness unless it's causing you to be sick. Speaking of the healthcare system, mm -hmm. you don't have to like share what insurance you have or anything, but was it a heavy cost for you? Was it a burden? Well, I told you what I do. So mm -hmm. I am an entrepreneur and I do it on my own business. So I do think if I did not have what I have in life, I wouldn't have been able to do or even live with my fibroids the way I did. By the end of it, I was going to the chiropractor. I was getting massages. So I was investing hundreds of dollars a month in care on my body. It luckily was not a very hefty bill when it comes to surgery and everything, because I think I definitely ended up paying less than $1,000. It was like 500 for my surgery and then like I want to say it was like two something for my hospital stay okay. Um, because I did have to stay in the hospital for like 48 hours after my surgery. Testing did cost a good amount of money because I had an MRI, I had an ultrasound. And at one point, because of all my GI issues, I had to get a CT scan too because they wanted to make sure there was nothing else going on down there. Um, so I probably had spent like $300 leading up to my surgery. So I definitely spent at least a thousand, if not $1,300 just getting up into surgery point. So it wasn't too much for me, but I don't know how other people see that. Also, I had good insurance because right. I'm telling you, I'm telling you how much I paid out of pocket. I think the, my surgery was like $8,000 on the bill and the hospital stayed probably like 5,000. So yeah, a good amount. 
I'm happy for you that you had the financial resources to take care of yourself, but it, it also makes me very frustrated. What if another woman is in this situation and she doesn't have those financial resources, you know, to get the extra things that would be needed to just care for yourself throughout that time when you're experiencing such pain. And like you said, anybody with a uterus could have this issue. It's not like, you know, there's something that we can do wrong or whatever. Like you might just, you might do everything right. You might be, you know, healthy or whatever and still, still end up with this issue. And like, if you do, you might not have good insurance or the things that you need. Mm -hmm. So it just makes me very sad about like our healthcare system and just that there isn't a priority on women's health and more resources available. I think um, it it's probably similar to, to what you were talking about with the breast reduction and like limited doctors and things like that, um, or just doctors even have a, a limited scope of your situation and treatment options. I think it more goes down that route because just like with a breast reduction, you know, your doctor would have to approve it as a medical ne necessity to get it covered. It's almost the same thing if your doctor isn't wanting to treat. So like I said, if they consider your fibroids, like, oh, yeah, you have fibroids, but you are you can live with it, even though you're like, hey, I got heavy periods, I'm sleepy all day because of the anemia, <laughs> you know what I mean? Things like that. If you're not, like, actively trying to have a child, they might not even decide to treat your fibroids. And then my main thing when it comes to insurance and things like that is, it's, like, really comes back to, like you said, advocacy and talking with your doctor. That's why I wanted to have this conversation was because why aren't we pre-screening women, at least after 30, we should be screening women and saying, hey, you should go get an ultrasound. So I think it's really important that Black women specifically, for sure, and women in general, I think it's very um, important to talk about this because women, they say it all the time, women are choosing less and less to have children. Women are choosing to have children later and later. If you pay attention to the health trends, uh, you know, people are getting diagnosed with things younger and younger every day. So I think women are going to probably start experiencing more symptoms of fibroids as they age and as they don't have children and just the food we eat. But um, <laughs> and so I think it's just going to be important that you're mindful of your own body. And even if, based on what you're saying, you know, I don't know what all you've done with your doctor already. But I don't think it would be weird to say, hey, could you um, put in an order for ultrasound and transvaginal for me? Because that's the minimal amount of testing that they can do. It is not um, super invasive. You don't have to put a gown on. Uh, what a transvaginal is internal imaging inside the uterine cavity. But, you know, the ultrasound is just on your stomach. And mm -hmm. I don't think the ultrasound was super expensive. It wasn't as expensive as the MRI. I know that. <laughs> Something as simple as that, when you turn 33, go to your OBGYN and say, hey, can I get an ultrasound? If you feel like your periods are heavy. A lot of Black women have anemia and we think it's normal. Okay, but you could have fibroids. You could have tumors all in your uterus. And I don't want to say the only treatment is hysterectomy, but fibroids can grow back. Oh my. That's why I think this conversation is important because- you as an example, if you know you don't want to have kids and your doctor says, hey, we need to remove these fibroids, why wouldn't you maybe go the route of a hysterectomy if you choose that? Or one of the, uh, there's other, op there's many other options nowadays for fibroid removal, but it's just like, I don't think all those options are always given. Mm -hmm. And so being aware of what is out there and being able to truly have autonomy over your body because I just know that it's very easy for the doctor to say even after they give you the ultrasound oh you have a few little fibroids and just dismiss it so I, I think realistically my situation was actually handled very well like I was actually taking very I won't say I was taken very seriously I didn't know what was going on but you know the doctor took me very seriously and recommended me to one of the best doctors in Baltimore and Maryland probably for what I got done. Like even my, my ultrasound tech was like, oh, you, you got that doctor. And I was like, yeah, I was like, and that's why also another reason I went ahead and got my fibers removed. I was like, I need to get in there before he retires. <laughs> I was like, let him do it. <laughs> Everyone's experience with fibroids will hundred percent be different. 
That's what I tell women when it comes to birth control. That's the main thing I tell people when they're like, should I get the IUD? Should I get this? I'm like, everybody's experience is different. I love my IUD until they couldn't pull it out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, like it, literally, I had no issues with my IUD until they couldn't find it. And I'm like, I don't know, you know, I had no issues with it. And so it's like with fibroids, everybody's experience is going to be different because I know my experience probably did not look at like most women's because most women probably didn't have the fibroid that I had. Like I saw a picture of it. It was huge. That probably really did affect my quality. Like I did at one point I told people it felt like I had a baseball in my left butt cheek. So I'm sure that that's not everybody's experience with fibroids because that's based on the position. It was sitting on my left side in a low spot. If you have a fiber on, the, like I said, the inside of your uterus, you're going to be bleeding like crazy and anemic. If you have maybe one on your ovary, it, it can vary. And then the other thing is just the size of your uterus. The size of my uterus, when they decided to go for rem- removal, my uterus was the size of 20 weeks pregnant. Wow. And wait a minute. That's probably one of the only things I've heard about fibroids is that some women talk a lot about having this bulge where they literally look pregnant and then come mm-hmm. to find out they have fibroids. That's so interesting. Sometimes if you don't have a bulge, you'll just have a lot of abdominal bloating and like even pain in your abdomen. You mean like actual abdomen, not even just like pelvis area. Actually. I mean, like... When I say my uterus was the size of a woman that was 20 weeks pregnant, they said my my uterus was up to my belly button. So think about the space. And that's why I talk about the emotional part of wrapping your head around. Like we already don't know what goes on in our bodies. And then you tell me, oh, you have a tumor and, you know, we're going to leave it. I found out I have fibroids and then my mom's like, oh, yeah, remember I have fibroids, blah, 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 blah. And my aunt's like, oh, yeah, I had that procedure done. Family history is important. And they do, they do ask you those questions. I remember I had a doctor asking me, like, my mom is diabetic. And then, you know, she was trying to tell me because I was overweight. She's like, oh, you know, if you get pregnant, you might have gestational diabetes. Or I'm like, I don't want to get pregnant. But I do understand that sometimes your family history can play a part. So it's really important that we talk to the other women in our family to see some of the things that they've had. I think when it comes to fibroids, I don't even know if it's even the same things like diabetes is like family history. I think it's just as simple as I did feel pretty lonely going through my experience. Um, Mm. And not that they weren't there, but I just feel like women should just talk about it more. Probably just like we talk about infertility in the first place and miscarriage and all these other things. I just think if fibroids is affecting this many of us that I think it's just important that we're definitely discussing it because even just the, like I say, if you can even just save somebody from the shock, you know, and I'm not going to say, oh, I was so victimized by the shock of it, but I, I didn't have to go through some of those emotions probably. <laughs> yeah. I hear you. That is really important. So I know you said that the doctors sometimes, again, if they don't consider it medically necessary, they might let you just live with it. So other than the issues with having children, do you know of any other complications that might come up that might hinder the quality of life? If the doctors just choose to say like, hey, we're not going to remove them. And do they offer any, I guess, like alternatives, like medication or anything to help? Yes. People get their fibroids removed to treat infertility. They also get their fibroids removed to treat literally all the symptoms I talked about. If, like I say, if it's really just a quality of life thing. And then they also get them removed if they're just large, like mine. And then when it comes to treatment, there's hysterectomy. There is an open myomectomy, like which I had, which is when they, like I say, physically open you up with a large incision and remove the fibroids. That's what they normally recommend if you plan on having kids and you have large fibroids because they want to be able to do the best job and visualize what's going on inside there. Then you have a laparoscopic procedure, which is the robotic procedure where they might go in through the belly button or make like little incisions on like the sides, your side, the sides of your abdomen or go in through the uterine cavity. Um, with the robot and that way you don't have to have a large incision which is supposed to be a quicker turnaround time and recovery then they also have what they call I think they call it UFE which is like uterine fibroid embolation or something there's a way 
where they can inject something into your the artery that's feeding the fibroid and it'll shrink all the fibroids. I think there just needs to be way more research done so that the options are really out there and we really know what is the best option to tr- for women to seek out treatment um, because they don't recommend that treatment for women trying to get pregnant. Some doctors have said that it really has not been researched because they just don't recommend it to women looking to get pregnant, dealing with fibroid issues. So that could be an option where women don't even have to get cut open, you know? Um, and it targets all the fibroids because it targets, like I said, the blood supply going straight to the fibroids. Then, of course, we talked about birth control. Birth control and hormonal treatments are also a way that doctors will treat fibroids. Not all fibroids need to be removed. I think you should just have autonomy over your body and you should be aware of whether or not you have fibroids and you should be able to make the decision to monitor them with your doctor because they can grow. Obviously, like I said, they can grow and they can grow back. So you should you should be able to know if they're there, if they're super tiny. Yeah, you can live with them. But if you're finding that you're having horrible periods or whatever, and you don't want to go on birth control, you know that you have these other options to do something about it. And that even that you have the option to do something about it instead of just being told that heavy periods are normal. You have a period every month. If you don't want to deal with something every month and there's treatment out there, you should be able to do that. I think it would be much nicer if women who want, even women that want to get pregnant, if you know that you have fibroids, at least you already can start preparing yourself for fertility and things like that. Whether you're married, not married, freeze your egg, you know, all those different things. Surgery isn't a little thing. I also don't think going on birth control is a little thing because it affects your weight and your hormones so much. There's just so many options out there. If you aren't planning on having kids, I kept running across women that were specifically getting hysterectomies. And like, I didn't find many women that were getting cut open, which is a lot for someone who hasn't had a kid yet. (laughs) There's even different forms of hysterectomies, you know, so that you don't have to deal with all the symptoms of a hysterectomy. (laughs) Um, Yeah, hysterectomies come with their own symptoms. I've heard that because our uterus does more than just like whole babies. I know a woman personally who is just like always talking about, I just want a hysterectomy. And I'm just like, I don't know all the things, but what I do know is like, you're, you're going to get rid of the issue you think you have because of the hysterectomy. And then you might invite more issues. I just know for sure that they said nowadays, if you're getting a hysterectomy, see if they can keep your ovaries. Basically they can do a hysterectomy where they don't remove the ovaries and those are supposed to have, be less symptomatic. So it's just really being able to have those conversations that's truly the most important because it's like I knew fibroids were a, a thing, but it wasn't until I got diagnosed with them that I realized how much it was. It's just one thing when you're dealing with an invisible ailment. You know, nobody can see what's going on with you. And because there isn't a ton of research done on it, Even the doctors, like I did ask my doctor, oh, do you think my weight could even just possibly be a symptom of the fibroids? No. And, you know, it's like I couldn't even like do floor exercises because my tailbone hurt so much. My mental health, I started going to therapy since the pandemic and things like that. And so there's so much that I wish I actually did have affirmation on in terms of what I was dealing with dealing with my fibroids and even now coming out of it, I'm realizing I have to rebuild certain muscles and that I'm not just feeling better and without pain. I'm still trying to manage my sciatic pain and basically all my pain has changed and I'm trying to now like rebuild my body without all these tumors. The interesting thing is I don't even know how long I had fibroids. Like I said, I had a fibroid that was huge. So I don't know how long that was in my body affecting me yeah um I still have my acid reflux but it's gotten so much better same thing with going to the restroom so much better based on everything that you've said what is your overall advice for women when it comes to our health specifically our reproductive health like what should we be looking for what should we be doing what is important for us to know and do moving forward I think It's most important that 
if you have gone your whole life and you're in your mid thirties and never had an ultrasound and you feel like you've had complications related to your cycle and things like that, or if you're experiencing a crap ton of GI issues and you feel like it's related to your reproductive system, I would definitely at least ask for an ultrasound from your doctor. That's my main recommendation. My second recommendation is, of course, that we just talk about it more, even if it's just, you know, moms talking to their daughters, if they experience fibroids and not thinking that your daughter just remembers that you you told them this when they were like 10, keep it in their mind as they're aging. And then I also just think that there is a lack of research out there and that there is also a good amount of misinformation out there as well. I know that some women don't seek um, removal and basically seek quality of life changing treatment because they're either afraid or they don't even know what's out there. Um, or they think some women think that they can shrink their fibroids naturally. I, I actually do love holistic medicine myself, but I do think that we have to be realistic when it comes to how we're enjoying life on this earth. And if you're in pain every day, you know, it took me going to therapy to, you know, my therapist was like, aren't you tired of being in pain? Like, why aren't you questioning being in pain every day? And, you know, doing something about it. So that's really just the main thing is just really being aware and having, being able to have autonomy, specifically dealing with our healthcare system, where you really do have to advocate for yourself because I have been big my whole life. And so I know that if I did not go to get my IUD removed, I probably would just still be told that I have acid reflux and all of these IBS issues and things like that, simply because of my weight and my diet. Right. And can I add to choose a good doctor, not even just like once you discover that something is wrong. I think it's good to start with choosing a good doctor. Sometimes we think we only have to choose the doctor that's just like easy is for us to get or like one that our insurance recommends for us. But no, like do the work. So find yourself a really good GYN. Check their reviews and look to see what their other mm -hmm. patients are saying and really look around and see who else accepts your insurance. I've had great doctors and I've had, yeah, not going back there. I want to write a review. <laughs> doctors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you made an important point thinking about what I was saying about how doctors, like their first defense is to just give you the easiest thing to see if the, I guess what they call clinical symptoms will just go away. And then they think nothing else is going on. If our doctor isn't listening, know that we can choose a different doctor who might listen a little bit better. Don't be afraid of like the treatment and the procedures or the procedures to get checked. For example, I had a mammogram. People were just like, oh, you know, mammograms are painful. Like that's the thing that people say. So I was the one putting off the mammogram. The people were calling me, calling me, calling me. I was so scared to go because I'm like, I'm going to be in pain. But like when I actually got there and like did it, I was like, oh, it's not painful. There's pressure. Actually, I think because I have a larger chest, it was easier because you could just like throw them in the machine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but like I was terrified. So I just think we have to prioritize our health over that fear. I, I, I saw a lot of women when I was doing my research that said, oh, I didn't take the pain meds because I was worried. You know yourself, but I don't get like, it's like so many people were afraid to take the pain meds. And I'm like, they only give you like 10. <laughs> I promise you, they're giving you the bare minimum and they just cut you open. So like you said, there there's so much misinformation that breeds fear. And it's like, no, you have options and it's safe. You might run into some duds, but... Mm -hmm. You, you have options. You don't have to just suffer. That's one thing for sure. Yeah, that's a good note to leave it off on. You don't have to just suffer. Well, thank you so much. I really do appreciate this conversation. It was so good. And I think it'd be so helpful for women navigating some reproductive health challenges. I hope it helps some women. And I appreciate that you were interested in the conversation. Hey, it's post-interview area. <laughs> I really hope that you enjoyed that episode. I hope you learned something new or different that you didn't know about fibroids. If you are going through a fibroid journey, let us know in the comments 
how you manage the situation. And if you have any recommendations or advice for other women, we'd love to learn from you as well. Thank you again for listening and I will catch y'all on the next one. Bye.